Well, the 1970s and the 1980s were well known within evangelical circles as the era of the battle for the Bible. We're going to talk a little bit about that this evening. That battle certainly hasn't ended, but that was kind of a a key watershed moment in the history of the evangelical church in the West, working through those issues. And speaking of watersheds, Francis Schaeffer used the illustration of a watershed to describe the importance of the topic of inerrancy or the trustworthiness of Scripture. And in 1984, at the height of this battle for the Bible, battle for the trustworthiness of Scripture, Francis Schaeffer published a work called The Great Evangelical Disaster. This is what he said in one of the portions of his book. He said, not far from where we live in Switzerland is a high ridge of rock with a valley on both sides. One time I was there when there was snow on the ground along that ridge. The snow was lying there unbroken, a seeming unity. However, that unity was an illusion. For it lay along a great divide, it lay along a watershed. One portion of the snow, when it melted, would flow into one valley. The snow which lay close beside would flow into another valley when it melted. Now, it just so happens on that particular ridge that the melting snow which flows down one side of that ridge goes down into a valley and then into a small river and then down into the Rhine River. The Rhine then flows on through Germany, and the water ends up in the cold waters of the North Sea. The water from the snow that started out so close along the watershed on the other side of the ridge, when this snow melts, drops off sharply down the ridge into the Rhone Valley. This water flows into Loch Leman, or as it is known in the English-speaking world, Lake Geneva and then goes down below that into the Rhone River, which flows through France and into the warm waters of the Mediterranean. The snow lies along that watershed, unbroken, as a seeming unity. But when it melts, where it ends in its destination is literally a thousand miles apart. That is a watershed. That is what a watershed is. A watershed divides A clear line can be drawn between what seems at first to be the same, or at least very close, but in reality ends in very different situations. In a watershed, there is a line. Now, why does he use this illustration? For what purpose? He explains it in the next paragraph. In his work, The Great Evangelical Disaster, he then writes this, What does this illustration have to do with the evangelical world today? I would suggest that it is a very accurate description of what is happening. Evangelicals today are facing a watershed concerning the nature of biblical inspiration and authority. It is a watershed issue in very much the same sense as described in the illustration within evangelicalism. There are a growing number who are modifying their views on the inerrancy of the Bible so that the full authority of Scripture is completely undercut. But it is happening in very subtle ways, like the snow lying side by side on the ridge. The new views on biblical authority often seem at first glance not to be so very far from what evangelicals until just recently have always believed. But also, like the snow lying side by side on the ridge, the new views, when followed consistently, end up a thousand miles apart. Francis Schaeffer used that illustration to describe what was happening 40 years ago in the height of that particular generation's battle for the Bible as a lot of movement was taking place and how terms were being defined. 
how the Bible was being assessed, historical criticism, the methodology of the Enlightenment, a highly rationalistic approach that put man as the judge in the seat over the Scriptures, was invading seminaries, even those that claimed to be evangelical. And those seminaries were then training the next generation of pastors who were imbibing these skeptical views on the trustworthiness of the Bible, all within the realm of Christian and evangelical vocabulary, and those men were then going forth into churches and spreading doubt about the trustworthiness of Scripture. It was for that reason that, that Francis Schaeffer called it the great evangelical disaster. It wasn't that the big problem was on the outside the critics on the outside attacking the Bible. No, the problem was on the inside with those working in sinister and subtle ways to undermine confidence in the inerrancy and infallibility of Scripture. He went on to say this as to the consequences of this, of this battle. He said, quote, "'Unless the Bible is without error,' not only when it speaks of salvation matters, but also when it speaks of history and the cosmos. We have no foundation for answering questions concerning the existence of the universe and its form and the uniqueness of man, nor do we have any moral absolutes or certainty of salvation, and the next generation of Christians will have nothing on which to stand. Now, this is what Francis Schaeffer stated 40 years ago. A lot has happened since that time. During that time also, you're familiar with the International Council on Biblical Inerrancy, which was formed a few years before 1984. It was formed in 1977. They put out what was called the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy. It's something that I'm going to get you to read this this coming week. And a lot of other resources were put together by a a band of of evangelicals who are evangelical in the true sense, scholars and pastors, even our own pastor, Pastor John, had a part in all of this, in, in setting up the flag in defense of biblical inerrancy. It was a battle, and those men of that generation understood what was at stake, just as Francis Schaeffer said, that if pastors and theologians would not stand in defense of the trustworthiness, the absolute trustworthiness of Scripture, then the next generation would have nothing upon which to stand. Now, that is not just a battle that took place in the 70s and 80s. And although many victories were won in those years, thanks to men like Pastor John and R.C. Sproul and Francis Schaeffer and Roger Nicole and many others, the battle still continues. In fact, this is not a battle limited to the late 1900s or early 2000s. This is a battle. The battle over the trustworthiness of God's Word is a battle that is as old as sin itself. You remember Genesis 3, and the temptation of the serpent was to question Eve as to what God had really said first questioning the clarity of God's Word, and then secondly, questioning the veracity of it. God did not mean what He said. One writer just recently, just a couple of years ago in a work on the doctrine of Scripture, summarized this well. Mark Thompson says this, the truthfulness of Scripture, its correspondence to reality, and its internal coherence have been under attack since the incident in the Garden of Eden. You will not surely die, the serpent told the woman in the face of God's warning to the contrary. Doubt about the veracity of God's Word was deliberately sown in order to cast doubt on God's character and His intention." End quote. That battle continues to this day. The serpent has had thousands of years to sharpen his weapons, 
And his ultimate aim is just that, to cast doubt on the character and intention of God. And one of the most effective ways that he does that is by undermining trust in the Word of God. Well, that's why we're studying this this evening on the trustworthiness of Scripture, that the Bible is truth. Now, before we get into that further, just a little bit of review to see from where we have already come. We've already looked at the concept of revelation itself. In our first study, we defined the doctrine of revelation as explaining that God is a God who speaks. That God is a God who reveals Himself to His creation. And the doctrine of revelation teaches that God has made knowledge of Himself known, and He has done so most decisively in the Scriptures. We then looked at the doctrine of inspiration. And the doctrine of inspiration teaches us how God has made that knowledge of Himself known in the Scriptures. Inspiration teaches us how God has made Himself known in the Scriptures. And we looked at three qualities, three descriptions of that manner of inspiration. We, we def- defined the inspiration of Scripture in these three ways. First of all, this inspiration is plenary in nature. It is characteristic of all that is properly called Scripture. In other words, everything that is rightly called Scripture, everything that is truly Scripture has been inspired. Inspiration is not limited to teaching books like the letter to the Romans or the Gospel of John. But inspiration extends plenarily to everything that is properly called Scripture. Secondly, we also noted that inspiration was what we called concursive in nature. In other words, the the manner by which God made this knowledge known was to work through human instruments, prophets, writers of Scripture in such a way that He would first teach them as he initially, even before that, developed them providentially over time to be the perfect ideal instruments to communicate the specific knowledge that they would, he, he formed them and then revealed himself and his knowledge to them and then ensured that they, by understanding it themselves, would then craft it in human language in a way that it would be at the one and the same time both the Word of God and the word of the prophet. We call that the concursive nature of inspiration. And thirdly, we also noted that inspiration extends all the way down to that verbal aspect. In other words, as God moved upon those biblical writers, He didn't just leave it in vague ideas. But the Spirit worked in the mind of the writer to such a degree that the writer's very choice of words in that original language, the the very choice of the word order, the structure and form that the writer used to express these ideas came also from the Holy Spirit. We call that verbal inspiration. Now, when we look at the doctrine of inspiration then, and these three aspects of, of the manner in which God has given us His Word, we can see the, the logical consequences that flow from that. We've already looked at this last week. We've looked at the, the logical consequence, the necessary consequence to the concursive nature of inspiration. Because God has inspired the Word the way He did, using the prophets in the way that He did, He ensured that His Word would be clear, that it would be accessible and understandable, that it would come through a human messenger in human language using human idioms and thought forms and patterns and structures. But when we talk about the verbal and the plenary nature of inspiration, This is where we get the necessary logical consequence that the Bible is therefore true. Because the mode of inspiration was concursive in nature, leads us to see that the Bible is clear, that the mode of inspiration was both plenary and verbal, leads us to the 
consequence that the Bible is true. We're going to see that as we study the Scriptures themselves this evening. Just a few quotes that help us on this. Francis Turretin, the 17th century Genevan theologian, he put it this way, the question is whether in writing they were so acted upon and inspired by the Holy Spirit, both as to the things themselves, the ideas, as to, and as to the words, as to be kept free from all error, and that their writings are truly authentic and divine. Our, adverse, our adversaries deny this, we affirm it. Notice the logical connection that Turretin recognizes, that because inspiration is, vo- is verbal in nature, it therefore leads to the conclusion that the very words of God, because they come directly from Him through that human instrument, they are truthful. B.B. Warfield stated something similarly when he said this, inspiration is, quote, a doctrine which claims that by a special, supernatural, extraordinary influence of the Holy Spirit, the sacred writers have been guided in their writing in such a way as while their humanity was not superseded, it was yet so dominated that their words became at the same time the words of God and thus in every case and all alike absolutely infallible. This is what we'll trace this evening as we study the doctrine of the infallibility or inerrancy of Scripture. Let's look at the nature then of truthfulness, and we have to define some terms right up front. And first of all, the the first term is, is actually just a general one. We have to identify the term truth and ask the question, what is truth? If we talk about the truthfulness of Scripture, what does that entail? Well, if we were to define truth theologically, correctly, we would answer it this way. Truth is that which corresponds to reality as determined by God. Truth is that which corresponds to reality as it is determined by God, not by us, not by creatures who are so impacted by our own subjectivity, our our own limited ability to see beyond ourselves who have very limited knowledge, truth is not determined by us. Instead, truth is that which corresponds to reality as God has determined it. We can say this, truth is that which is contrary to falsehood. Truth is contrary to error. And when we talk about error or falsehood, we we recognize that error and falsehood always originate in one of two problems. It either originates in ignorance or it originates in deceit. But conversely, when we talk about truth, any expression of truth originates in knowledge and in integrity. And this is going to be a a very important concept to, to keep in mind. If there are errors in the Scriptures, it it then suggests and requires that that error has arisen either due to ignorance or to deceit. And summarizing this concept of truth and God as the standard of truth, Tim Challies has a helpful statement here when he writes this, truth is what God thinks. It is what God does. It is what God is. It is what God has revealed of Himself in the Bible. Truth is found in its fullest form in God, for He is truth. He is the very source and origin of all truth. Now, with that in mind, we come to our first major term that is important to identify and define as it relates to the trustworthiness or truthfulness of the Bible, and that term is the term infallibility. Infallibility. We talk about 
the Bible as being infallible. What does that mean? We can define infallibility this way. To be infallible means to be incapable of failing. Positively, it means to be trustworthy. To be incapable of failing, or stated positively, to be trustworthy. J. I. Packer adds this helpful definition. He says of infallibility, it is, quote, the quality of neither, uh, of neither deceiving nor being deceived. In fact, we can use that adjective infallible to describe all kinds of situations, but we specifically use it to refer to the Bible. And, and as J. I. Packer says, when something is infallible, when you speak of the Bible as being infallible, it means it has the quality of neither deceiving nor being deceived. E. J. Young, another one who wrote much on the infallibility and inerrancy of Scripture back in the 1960s and 70s, defined it this way. He said, Scripture is unfailing, incapable of proving false, erroneous, or mistaken. Now, just very quickly, we'll, we'll come to other biblical testimony in a few moments, but a, a quick text to look at in this regard would be John 10.35 where Jesus says in the midst of an argument, citing a statement from the book of Psalms, he throws in this parenthetical statement as he addresses the Pharisees, and he says, the Scripture cannot be broken. And that is, there is a very direct reference to the infallibility of Scripture. It is incapable of failing. As we heard already this evening, as we sang of the faithfulness of God, God cannot deny Himself. He cannot break His Word. His Word is utterly trustworthy. Or 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 25, again, highlighting the unbreakable nature of Scripture, Peter, citing the book of Isaiah, says, "...the Word of the Lord endures forever." The Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy adds this further definition to the term infallibility. It, it stated it this way, infallible signifies the quality of neither misleading nor being misled, and so safeguards in categorical terms the truth that Holy Scripture is a sure, safe, and reliable rule and guide in all matters. The second term that is associated with the trustworthiness of the Bible is the term inerrancy. And in more recent times, inerrancy has dominated the discussion, rightly so, because what happened with the older term infallibility was that in that era of the the, the compromise taking place in evangelical seminaries was that infallibility was being used to define the Bible only in matters of faith, only in matters of ethics, but not in matters of historical reporting. And so, infallibility became redefined. It was quarantined, so to speak, to, to speak only of matters of faith. As a result, theologians back in the 1970s began speaking more and more of inerrancy in order to emphasize that the Bible's infallibility is not limited just to the gospel. It's not limited just to the message of salvation, but extends also to all the historical details that are contained in the Scriptures. Now, what does that term inerrancy mean? We can define it this way, simply stated to be inerrant means to be without error, to be without error. To state that positively, to be inerrant means to state that which is entirely true or consistent with reality. To be inerrant, to be in inerrant means to state something which is entirely consistent with reality. J.I. Packer provided this definition. He said to be inerrant means freedom 
from error of any kind, factual, moral, or spiritual. Again, looking at what E.J. Young wrote, he said this, by the use of the term inerrancy, quote, we mean that the Scriptures possess the quality of freedom from error. They are exempt from the liability of mistake, incapable of error. In all their teachings, they are in perfect accord with the truth. For a a text reference, one text that would summarize this would be John 17, 17. The second half of that verse, as part of Jesus' high priestly prayer, he, 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 he calls upon the Father to sanctify them in the truth and then says this, your word is truth. Your word is truth. Again, citing from the Chicago Statement of Biblical Inerrancy, the statement defines inerrancy this way, the term inerrant, quote, signifies the quality of being free from all falsehood or mistake, and so safeguards the truth that Holy Scripture is entirely true and trustworthy in all its assertions. To read a little bit more from the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy, there's some commentary that was added to that statement. Like I said, this coming week, I, I'll send you a link, and I want you to read through this historic and very helpful statement. But this is in part of the, the preamble to that statement. I want to read just a few portions of it. It's here on the screen. The, the framers of this statement state the following. God, who is Himself truth and speaks truth only, has inspired Holy Scripture in order thereby to reveal Himself to lost mankind through Jesus Christ as Creator and Lord, Redeemer and Judge. Holy Scripture is God's witness to Himself. They go on, Holy Scripture being God's own Word, written by men, prepared and superintended by the Holy Spirit, is of infallible divine authority in all matters upon which it touches. It is to be believed as God's instruction in all that it affirms, obeyed as God's command in all that it requires, embraced as God's pledge in all that it promises." Being holy and verbally God-given, Scripture is without error or fault in all its teaching, no less in what it states about God's acts in creation, about the events of world history, and about its own literary origins under God, than in its witness to God's saving grace in individual lives. Now, that is very absolute language. God's Word is truth. It follows, as we will see, upon Scripture's own self-witness. But there's a few qualifications that we do have to add because, as with any important concept, you do have to make these qualifications and explanations so that the concept isn't abused or misapplied. And when it comes to qualifications of the doctrine of inerrancy, here are some of them. These come from various authors, particularly one by the name of Paul Feinberg. Here's one. Inerrancy does not demand a strict adherence to the rules of grammar. In other words, sometimes in the Scriptures, when you look at the original languages, there are oddities and peculiarities. There are stylistic idiosyncrasies that you find in the the way of a particular writer's writing. And inerrancy doesn't negate that to suggest that all writers had to have the same style. No, at times the writers bend the grammatical rules, but that doesn't challenge inerrancy. Secondly, inerrancy does not exclude the use of either figures of speech or literary genres. That the Bible uses parables or proverbs or laments it is, it has nothing to do with an attack on Inerrancy. Inerrancy doesn't require scientific language. Inerrancy can be a quality of poetry. It can be a quality of 
parable. It can be a quality of prophecy. Thirdly, inerrancy does not demand historical or semantic precision. When the gospel writers record that Jesus fed the 5,000 men, it doesn't mean that there has to be exactly 5,000, not 5,001 or 4,999. There's always estimations and rounding up that happens in all language, and it doesn't make it inherently false. Fourth, inerrancy does not demand the technical or observational language of modern science. So, for example, if the Bible speaks of the sun rising, that is not an an error. In fact, if you go on your phones and look at the weather forecast, that same kind of terminology is used today. But the sun doesn't rise. But it's not regarded, even in the scientific realm, as being an error to speak of sunrise and sunset. And yet, those who seek to discredit the Bible will often use that kind of expectation to suggest that the Bible has error. Fifth, inerrancy does not require verbal exactness in the citation of Old Testament texts in the New Testament. Sometimes the biblical writers merely echo the Old Testament text. Sometimes they paraphrase it. Sometimes they quote just portions of a sentence or a a section from the Old Testament. And again, that is not uh, uh, to undermine inerrancy. A sixth qualification here. Inerrancy does not guarantee the exhaustive comprehensiveness of any single account or of combined accounts where those are involved. So when you look at the book of Kings and Chronicles, you'll find differences in those accounts. One written, one set of books written by prophets, the others written by priests who are, or a priest who is moved by the Spirit, and they'll include different details of the kings, the, the era of Israel's kings. And the fact that they provide different details is not an example of, of errancy. Or you take the Gospels. The fact that you'll have uniquenesses in each of the four Gospels, and especially the Gospel of John, doesn't mean that those Gospels are errant because they don't repeat each other verbatim and have the same style, the same ordering, the same verbiage, and so on. Another qualification is this. Inerrancy does not demand the infallibility or inerrancy of the non-inspired sources used by the biblical writers. So Jude quotes from the Apocrypha, and Paul quotes from Greek poets, It is not correct to think that then we must also look on those extra-biblical sources as being inerrant. No. Spirit-moved authors can incorporate statements for themselves. They can appropriate that language into what then is an inerrant text. Furthermore, inerrancy does not demand historical or semantic precision. Finally, a couple of others left here. Inerrancy does not automatically extend to the copies made of the original inspired manuscripts. So, we know that copies were made of those original manuscripts, and by looking at all the hundreds and thousands of manuscripts that exist today of copies, we can see that there are errors in the copies. That doesn't imply that the original had errors as well. We're going to leave it to a future session where we'll look at the preservation of God's Word, but inerrancy, strictly speaking, refers to that original manuscript. Finally, inerrancy does not automatically extend to any interpretation of the biblical text When we say that the Bible is infallible, that it is inerrant, doesn't mean we're saying automatically you're going to understand it correctly. Doesn't mean that automatically then your interpretation of it is going to be inerrant. Those are two different things. In summarizing some of the qualifications, John Feinberg helps explain what we really mean by 
an inerrant text when he says this, Scripture contains Satan's lies, Job's friends or comforters' erroneous evaluations of his situations, the mishandlings of Scripture, as in the Pharisees' twisting of Scripture to try to trap Jesus, and immoral reasoning of people like Caiaphas, who believed it morally preferable that an innocent man, Jesus, should die instead of many Jews being slaughtered by the Romans as they quelled a rebellion that Jesus' followers might instigate. All of this is in Scripture. And since all Scripture is God, God's Word, the incorrect thinking just mentioned must also be God's Word. These passages are the Word of God, but that just means the Holy Spirit wanted a written account of what these individuals said, not that their false claims are true. So, for example, one of the common attacks on inerrancy is to say, well, we'll look at Jesus's, or excuse me, look at Satan's temptation of Jesus and how he twists Scripture. We see that in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4. See, the Bible isn't inerrant, but such an approach misunderstands inerrancy. Inerrancy means that the account of Satan's twisting of Scripture is entirely truthful. Or when the psalmist says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. We're not saying that phrase, there is no God, taken out of context and treated just as a statement of Scripture, that that automatically means that the Bible is errant because we know there is a God. No, instead inerrancy means that the psalmist has got it right when he says it's the fool who says there is no God. Paul Feinberg then says this, when all the facts are known, the Scriptures in their original autographs and properly interpreted will be shown to be wholly true in everything they affirm, whether that has to do with doctrine or morality or with the social, physical, or life sciences. And this definition has stood the test of time. As we've noted the attack on the veracity and purity of God's Word has existed since the dawn of sin itself. And yet all of the supposed examples of discrepancies have been shown to have faithful responses, explanations which uphold the inerrancy of God's Word. Let's look at the testimony then to truthfulness. How do we see this play itself out then in Scripture in general and in particular? Well, first of all, when we, we talk about the biblical evidence for the trustworthiness or the inerrancy or infallibility or veracity of Scripture, we look particularly at three categories of evidence. The first one is this, the necessary consequence of God's character. An infallible, inerrant Bible is the necessary consequence of a God who cannot lie, but is both omniscient and righteous. He's not ignorant or deceitful. He is omniscient and righteous, and He cannot deny Himself. And so, we find in Scripture numerous cases where the Scriptures hold up God's Word as being incapable of, of being alive. For example, Numbers 23, 19 God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Has he said and he will not do, or has he spoken and will he not make good? Notice again the omniscience and righteous character of God. Titus 1 verses 1 and 2, where Paul introduces his letter to Titus with these words, Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of those chosen of God and of the knowledge of the truth which is, an according, which is according to godliness in the hope of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised long ago. Notice again how Paul weaves these ideas together. He, he's speaking of truth, knowledge of the truth. 
which has been given to him to reveal to Titus and through Titus. And it comes from a God who cannot lie. Moreover, we know that the very agent of inspiration, we studied this back when we looked at the doctrine of inspiration, the agent of inspiration is the Holy Spirit. And as the Scriptures define the Holy Spirit, He is commonly associated with truth itself. For example, John 15, 26, as Jesus prepares His disciples for His departure, He promises them of the the coming Helper who would give them the knowledge and remembrance they needed. And this is what Jesus said, when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. He will testify about me. He, that agent of inspiration, He is the Spirit of truth. John 16, 13, just a few sentences later in in this farewell discourse of Jesus, He says this to the disciples again, but when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all the truth. And this is a promise being made specifically to the apostles who would have that responsibility of communicating God's Word to the nations. He will guide you into all the truth, for He will not speak on His own initiative, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will disclose to you what is to come. Thus, in light of the nature of of God's inspiration of Scripture. It's both plenary and verbal. In light of the spirit of truth's ministry here, Scripture necessarily reflects God's truthfulness. In fact, you could put it as a syllogism in this way, a kind of a logical way of thinking. There's a first premise which says this, all Scripture is the product of divine inspiration, which encompasses all that is properly called Scripture and extends to the very choice of words. That leads then to a second premise, no word from God can be false or contrary to reality since God cannot lie. He is both omniscient and righteous, the very God of truth. And that then leads to the conclusion, therefore, no part of Scripture can mislead or communicate error when understood according to its intent. There is a second category of testimony, the explicit self-descriptions of Scripture itself. When the words of the biblical text describe the words of the biblical text. For example, 2 Samuel 7 verse 28, now, O Lord God, you are God and your words are truth. And you have promised this good thing to your servant. It's David speaking of the Davidic covenant, your words, the words of the promises in that covenant. He says, your words are truth. Psalm 12 verse 6, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace on the earth, refined seven times. The psalmist is looking for that kind of language that would be hyperbolic, that would express the purity of God's Word, and he refers to silver refined seven times. Psalm 18 verse 30, as for God, His way is blameless. The Word of the Lord is tried. It's proven, you could say. He is a shield to all who take refuge. Psalm 19, verses 7 to 9, even the the descriptions used there for the Word of God indicate this purity and veracity. God's Word is perfect. It is sure. It is right. It is pure. It is clean. It is true. It is righteous altogether. Psalm 119, verse 140, your word, the psalmist says, as he's got the scrolls of the law in front of him, as he's studying and as he's praying so that he might understand them, he himself is also writing at the same time words of Scripture. And he writes this, your words, or your word is very pure, therefore your servant loves it. 
Psalm 119, 151, you are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are truth. Psalm 119, 160, the sum of your word, looking at it in its entirety, what it all equals up to, and it equals up to truth. And every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting. Proverbs 30, verses 5 to 6, every word of God is tested. He is a shield to those who take refuge in Him. Do not add to His words or He will reprove you and you will be proved a liar. In other words, the moment anybody seeks to add to that word who is not moved by the Spirit as one of God's chosen instruments, anyone who would add to that word is the liar. God, however, is the one who alone and only speaks truth. John 17, 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word, Jesus says, is truth. There's a third category of evidence that we could look at, and this is how Jesus Christ assessed the historical reliability of the Old Testament. And it's interesting to note in many of the attacks on the veracity of Scripture today, those attacks are aimed precisely at the Old Testament. The creation narrative, the fall, the flood, Sodom and Gomorrah, the exodus out of Egypt and all the miracles that occurred then, and then the time of the prophets and the miracles produced by the prophets of Israel, those tend to be the issues which skeptics focus on. And what is fascinating to note is that we are not left without an authoritative assessment on the Old Testament, provided by Jesus Christ Himself. He rises to give us a voice beyond any others as to the historical reliability of the Old Testament. And in fact, what you find, and it's a wonderful thing in the providence of God, that many of Jesus' references to the Old Testament, references to Old Testament narratives are precisely in those areas where critics have sharpened their swords the most. B.B. Warfield put it this way, we believe this doctrine of the plenary inspiration of the Scriptures, and he's speaking there also of its infallibility, primarily because it is the doctrine which Christ and his apostles believed, and which they taught us. Another writer, John Wenham, puts it this way, Jesus consistently treats the historical narratives as straightforward records of fact. Never do you find Jesus taking an Old Testament account and giving a different twist. Never do you find him correcting something that was there. Instead, it is crystal clear. He assumes the absolute reliability and veracity of the Old Testament narrative texts. And just quickly going through this, let me give you some example, some examples. When it refers to what we call primeval history, the earliest history of mankind, the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis, what do we find? Jesus refers to both the creation of man as well as Noah and the flood. And, and we find that in Matthew. You can look at the, the text there in your handout. You can follow up on these, read them for yourselves. But what do you find? Jesus refers to these things not skipping a beat. He assumes they're absolute historicity, never questions it at all. In fact, builds his argument on the fact that these texts correspond, these Old Testament texts describing primeval history correspond to reality. We could look at patriarchal history, the history of the patriarchs, chapters 12 through 50 of the book of Genesis, for example. He refers to Abraham as a historical figure. He refers to Sodom and Gomorrah several times, and he refers to those cities as historical cities and their sin as historical in nature. He refers to Lot and Lot's wife. He refers to Isaac and to Jacob as historical figures. We then can look at what we call Israelite history, the the period of of Exodus all the way through to, to the book of Malachi. And what do we find? We find Jesus referring repeatedly to Moses every time, treating him and and the context from which Jesus draws as historically accurate. The manna and the wilderness wanderings, 
accurate. The wilderness serpent, accurate. David and the very rare, interesting situation with David and the showbread in the tabernacle, Jesus says, accurate. Solomon and the queen of Sheba, accurate. Elijah and Elisha, accurate. Jonah being in the fish, accurate. That one in particular has has raised the ire of many skeptics, and yet Jesus says, this is historically accurate. He makes a statement in Luke chapter 11, verses 49 to 51, which is very fascinating. I won't read it. Go back and read it. But he refers to the blood of Abel and the blood of Zechariah. And by doing so, Jesus covers thousands of years, all the way from the beginning of the Old Testament to the end of the Old Testament in Second Chronicles. And he treats it all as historically accurate. From beginning to end, The Old Testament for Jesus is a historical reality, and he he affirms that which so many skeptics, what they call myth today, never once does he cast suspicion on it. He assumes it to be true. And so when some scholar says that Jonah couldn't have been in in the belly of a great fish, our response is, well, you have to take that up with Jesus. He is the one who said it's true. Your problem is not with me. Your problem is not even specifically with the text. Your problem is with Jesus. We could look at another category, a fourth category. I'm not going to spend time in this because our time is short, but some have tried to suggest that the doctrine of infallibility or the veracity of Scripture is a new doctrine invented from the battle for the Bible in the 1970s or 1980s or perhaps maybe a century just before that, but it's not the view of the church, and that is not correct either. You could look at Irenaeus, one of the earliest apologists for the early church. He said the Scriptures are indeed perfect. You could look at Augustine in his dispute with Jerome, writes to Jerome a letter and says this, it is to the canonical Scriptures alone that I am bound to yield such implicit subjection as to follow their teaching without admitting the slightest suspicion that in them any mistake or any statement intended to mislead could find a place. You could look at Luther, you could look at Calvin, you could look at the Puritans. There is an undeniable history, a lineage of men who have staked their lives on the fact that this Bible is absolutely trustworthy in all that it communicates. Now, there have been challenges to this truthfulness. Our time is up. I won't go through these. I'll just list them. Some have wrongly said that to be human is to err, and therefore, since Scripture contains a human element, there must be error. They run aground really quickly when they have to deal with the person of Christ. He was human and divine, and He spoke only truth. Others say historical accuracy is not necessary for religion, so it is not necessary for the Bible to be true. But Paul says our faith is based on historical reality. If it isn't, we, above all men, are to be pitied. Others say the Bible is at odds with science, history, and archaeology. Oh, there's so much we could say there. Just look at COVID. How trustworthy is science? Or they'll say the Bible contains contradictions. I remember as a young man, I'd just been newly saved, attended a small country church, and the denomination sent a preacher to that church, and he tried to make the case that from the book of Acts we find discrepancies in Paul's testimony looking at Acts chapter 9 and Acts chapter 26. And I remember being stirred by that. I went home, and it only took me a short amount of time, and I had the answer, there's no discrepancy here. And I had the the courage to call up that pastor, a young 16-year-old, speaking to a 60-year-old. But I would say this, it was one of my brighter moments. I said, how could you do this? How could you go before a church and tell the church or try to tell the church that the Bible is trustworthy? Look right here, I've got the answer. You didn't even explain it. How dare you? How dare you? Others will say inerrancy is a modern invention that was never advocated until the 19th century, and as I said, that has also been proven to be a myth. 
The Bible is truth. And that leads us now to some implications. Let's close with these. Number one, the Bible provides the trustworthy justification for our belief. We're not just holding opinions or suggestions or plausibilities. When we believe the Bible, we are believing in that which is fact. B.B. Warfield put it this way, the trustworthiness of Scripture lies at the foundation of trust in the Christian system of doctrine and is therefore fundamental to the Christian hope and life. Just think of it, men, if the Bible is not true, and this is where the skeptics want to get you, this is, this is where they want you ev- eventually to end up. If the Bible is not true, then what hope do we have? The skeptics, including the enemy of your own soul, wants you to be without hope. They want you to be lost without any foundation, with any anchor for your soul. And they do, they get you there by undermining the trustworthiness of Scripture. But oh, this is a trustworthy word. This is truth itself. And that justifies our belief. And that's why Scripture never treats doubt or skepticism as a virtue. God has spoken, and He has only spoken what is true. Number two, the Bible, not only does it give us the foundation for our belief, but the Bible then exercises an unassailable unassailable authority over our conscience. And here, too, is where the the skeptics want, want to get out of this implication. They don't want to be bound. And so, if they can undermine the Scriptures by saying there's errors in the historical reporting, they can then cast dispersion upon everything it says, even about ethical matters. But because the Bible is true, it has authority to bind our conscience. It means we have no alternative. It's what God said. It is not an error. He has not misspoken. When He speaks about sexual ethics, it's as clear as day, and there is no error. When He speaks about marriage, when He speaks about masculinity or femininity, when He speaks of those issues, when He speaks on the Trinity, when He speaks on salvation by grace alone, all of those things are fact and bind our consciences to believe. Francis Turretin, the Puritan, said it this way, the basis is the divine and infallible truth of the books which have God as author because He has the supreme privilege of binding mankind to faith and obedience. You can't look at the Bible and say, yeah, that's what I know it says, but I don't need to believe it because I don't know if it's true. No, it is true, and therefore, you are bound. Number three, the Bible provides the necessary mandate for our proclamation. Our pastor has written extensively on this, especially as it relates to pastoral ministry and expository preaching, but just look at this as it relates to evangelism. You don't need to fear. When you speak with your unbelieving neighbor or your coworker, you can proclaim the truth, and you don't need to fear the, the responses. It is true. Preach it. And finally, number four, the implication of the Bible's inerrancy gives us powerful motivation for praise. Powerful motivation for praise. He has given us this unassailable, infallible, inerrant, true Word. And that means everything He has said, including His precious promises to us, cannot be broken. Joel Beakey and Paul Smalley put it this way, since the Word of God is pure truth, we can and should place our complete trust in what God has said To trust in the Bible for truth is to trust in the God who cannot lie. Therefore, the trustworthiness of the Bible is the trustworthiness of God. Means His promises, including that promise when He says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That is true. When it says that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever should believe in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. 
That is absolute truth. When Jesus says, come to me all ye ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, that is truth. And you can bet your whole life on it. And if you don't embrace those promises, primarily those promises of the gospel, which promise to you forgiveness of sins, a transformed life, peace with God, if if you don't believe them, it's not because God has spoken in some kind of unclear way where there may be mistakes. No, if you don't believe them, it's because you're the fool. It's because you're the one who refuses to believe the truth. That's where the onus lies. But I beg you, if you haven't believed this word, do so today, tonight. It's true and it's unbreakable. Believe in Him, and He will save you. Let's pray. What a joy it was, our Father, to sing those hymns earlier this evening. Great is Thy faithfulness, and You will hold us fast. And we can sing those precious hymns because you are a God who is trustworthy, who never lies, and you have given us a word that is completely consistent with your character. We thank you for this precious word, and we pray that our love for you would grow ever hotter and deeper as we realize more and more of this precious gift that you have placed within our hands. We thank you, Father, for your love and benevolence toward us in your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.